So uh, evening, everybody. It's such a pleasure to be hosting our second Dublin Administrators Meetup in June. Um, I'm thrilled uh, to introduce today's speaker. And uh, for a few reasons, um, the reason we're meeting today is because Pablo's reached out and we were really excited to collaborate with each other. So kudos to you, Pablo, for making that connection. Um, as a resident of Dublin, it's also exciting because I hope in the near future, we'll see you in person at a meetup and we can share some conversation and drinks together. Um, for everybody on the call, Pablo has over a decade of experience developing on the Salesforce platform and unsurprisingly is employed as a lead Salesforce engineer at Guidewire um, using those skills and experiences. But that's not why Pablo's talking to us today. He's talking to us today because he's done something rather remarkable. He's created an, uh, an app, a free open source app called Happy Soup. And uh, that's what we're gonna be talking about today. It's an impact and dependency analysis tool for Salesforce. I think that can really benefit the members of the administrative group here and the Salesforce community at large. Uh, so with that, I'll hand it over to you, Pablo. I hope I haven't missed anything too major. Uh, feel free to fill in on any gaps about yourself, your work, or happy soup as you feel uh, is appropriate. Okay. No, no, I think that that pretty much covers it. Um, that is me, and uh, yeah. So happy soup has been live, I think, for almost a year. It's going to be a year in probably about two months or so. Uh, so it's been a lot of work, and I'm, I'm very excited to show it to you here. Um, there is also, just so you know, before I start, there's another version of Happy Soup in development, which I call Happy Soup 2.0. And at the end of the demo, I'm going to show pretty much the same thing, but on the new version, just so you get an idea of what's coming. And then I'll discuss a little bit about the roadmap and, and the inspiration for that roadmap. So can I share my screen then? Right, okay, so there isn't a lot to show here on the deck because most of it is is very visual. So I'm gonna talk about you know what Happy Soup is. Uh, the actual name is happysoup.io. Uh, I'm gonna explain what impact analysis is because I realize that it's not, doesn't mean the same for everyone. And then at the end, we're gonna talk about deployment boundaries, which is a brand new concept. Um, that I'm trying to introduce a Salesforce ecosystem and Happy Soup is so far the only tool that allows you to create deployment boundaries. So as uh, we said earlier, so Happy Soup is basically an open source project. For those not familiar with open source, it essentially means that the entire code that allows the application to run is out there for everyone to see. So if you wanted to download the code, if you wanted to create your own version of Happy Soup, you can. I'm going to show later where that is hosted. But that is just to say that it's out there for everyone. Then the main idea is that it allows admins and developers to understand dependencies in the org. And dependencies actually come in two flavors. The first one is impact analysis, which is understanding the implications of a change that you're doing in the org. So for example, if you're editing a custom field or if you're replacing the value of a pick list from A to B, or if you're changing an Apex class, what is the impact of that? So that's the first flavor of dependency. And the second one sounds almost the same as you know what I just said, but it's dependency analysis, which is not the same. And I'll explain a little bit more why dependency analysis is not the same as impact analysis. And a quick summary is that this is because with dependency analysis, we can actually come up with this concept that I, that I mentioned briefly about deployment boundaries, which the main purpose is to allow for scratch org development. So this is just very high level. Uh, high le uh, level. I know it doesn't make a lot of sense, but I'm gonna go through all the steps um, later. So some use cases about impact analysis. So let's say again, if you change a custom field, right? Some Something that would seem like such a naive change could actually have a huge impact in the org. For example, report filters. So let's say you have a custom field that is a pick list where one of the values is A, the letter A, and you have 100 reports that are using that value to, you know, as a filter. You know, you have a report where it says where account field uh, pick list equals A. If you suddenly rename that value to something else, that report actually, that filter would just stop working. Salesforce doesn't actually tell you anything and you would never know unless people start telling you that, hey, how come all of a sudden all these reports are showing a bunch of data that was not there before? And that's because you changed the value of, of, of that pick list. But that's just one example. Then 
you could have, again, uh, Apex classes that use the value of this pick list in if else logic. So going back to the same example, if the value of the pick list is A, you could have some logic that says, if the value is A, do this. If it's C, do this other thing. If you change that value to something completely different, again, Salesforce won't tell you, and that logic will simply not run ever again unless you actually go to that class and modify the logic to um, have the new value that you added. Another example is uh, if you're using uh, fields in workflow rules. And this actually is twofold. You could use a field in a workflow rule as a criteria, and it's pretty much the same as what I just said. If you change the value of a pick list and that value is used in that criteria, that criteria is no longer valid. Another example is when you have a workflow, that workflow could do a field update on that field. And again, if that value doesn't exist anymore, you would start seeing wrong values populated on that field over time. And you need a way to understand who's actually populating this value in this field. And with dependency analysis, you can eventually learn that there is a workflow that is actually using that field to populate data. And again, all of this, I'm going to show examples. The other thing, the other use case is, let's say you're an independent consultant or someone who joined a new company or someone who's working on a brand new org and brand new to you, right? You're not familiar with that org. So you don't know anything about the architecture of that org, how objects are used, et cetera. So, you could use Happy Soup to understand at a high level where some of the metadata is used. And I'll give an example of this, but a good use case is, for example, you join and you don't know anything about the opportunity object. You would like to know at a high level, how do we use opportunities in this org? Do we use it in workflow rules? Do we use the opportunity object in Apex classes or triggers? Or maybe we don't use it at all because the company decided to create its own custom object that mimics the opportunity. And so with Happy Soup, you could actually see at a high level where an object is used, again, just at a very high level. Um, and the other uh, use case for a new consultant is that imagine that you're asked to work on an Apex class that already exists, already has a bunch of functionality, a lot of dependencies, and they ask you to add some new functionality. That class is brand new to you. You don't know anything about class. You don't know about the objects that it uses. You don't know about the fields that it uses to drive logic or what data it actually inserts or updates. As I'll show later with Happy Soup, you can actually create a deployment boundary of that class and very quickly see everything that that class uses and depends on, and that will give you an idea of what that class is dealing with. And Another use case is you can use this for page layout optimization. And I'm actually gonna stop here because I'm aware that if I just explain this, a lot of it doesn't make sense. So I'm actually gonna head over to Happy Soup and go through the exact same scenarios one by one. All right, so Happy Soup um, is on Happy Soup that I also, it is uh, a web application. So it's not something that you need to install on your org. And th that is a good thing because it means you can use it in any org very easily you don't need any installation locally or anything like that so you just head over to happysoup.io you can log in with a production org a sandbox or my domain in this case when i use my domain it already remembers the previous domain that i used before so that's sort of a nice feature in case you use that domain uh, quite frequently but you could always change that so i'm just going to go here and log in and as you can see the ui is very straightforward there's just one page and the first thing you're asked to do is select the metadata type. And an important thing here to understand is that even though I gave examples about custom fields and Apex classes, you can actually do impact analysis on a lot more metadata types. And we'll give, I'll, I'll give an example of that. But so let's go back to the example of a pick list field, right? You change the value of a pick list field and you want to know if I change this, what's gonna happen? So the first thing you do is you select custom fields. That's gonna pull the fields from your org so that you can then just come here and um, search for them uh, very quickly. So in this case, I'm gonna go with the customer priority one and I'm going to choose the option to see where it is used or impact analysis. There is another option for deployment boundary, but I'm going to explain that later on. There are also top which 
it's called toppings as in a pizza, you know, you add extra toppings. So these are additional options um, that you can do to see more uh, or different kinds of impact analysis. And I'm not gonna show this right now because it'll be confusing. So let's just go ahead and see uh, where this field is used. Okay, so as you can see, the first thing that we have is a chart that shows you all the metadata types that are used in this field. And the number here is the number of metadata types using that field. So the nice thing about this is that in two seconds, you immediately know that the highest number of metadata types that use this field are workflow rules and flows, being five and five respectively. So you don't need to do any counting or any summarizing to understand you know, what's the metadata type that is gonna be mostly impacted by this. You immediately know that is workflow rules. Of course, in a real org, this could be 100 or 200 workflow rules, and then you will know, okay, I'm in trouble because <laughs> there's gonna be a lot of work to do to understand uh, what would happen if I change this field. Now, the actual metadata types that use the field uh, are grouped here by their metadata type. So I'm gonna start with the Apex class. So what we see here is that there are three classes using that custom field, um, customer priority. But one important thing uh, to understand is that it's not enough to know that an Apex class uses one field. If I tell you that this class false positive is using the customer priority field, that doesn't really tell you much about the impact because you don't know how it's used. Is it used to insert data into that field, or is it actually used just to drive decision-making logic? Like if this value is this, then do that, otherwise do this. And that can actually mean a whole different um, scope for impact analysis. So for example, this class here is actually writing data to that field. And you can see that here with the right uh, pill. And so Happy Soup does that analysis for you very quickly so you don't so that you don't have to actually click on the class name and inspect all the details and try to find you know how the field is actually used. And why this is important is because a common scenario that I've seen is where sometimes you're troubleshooting a field having a particular value that you don't know where that value is coming from. That value is not something that people would populate on the UI. There's also not an integration that is populating that value. So somewhere, somewhere, you know, uh, something is putting that value in that field. So if you go here and you use happy soup, then you would immediately see that this class is actually right into that field. Again, in a real org, you could easily get 50 classes using that field. So the ability to know which ones are right into it very quickly allows you to save a lot of time because then you can just go to those classes that are right into it and, um, you know, then you can inspect their, the, the actual code to see if, if they are the ones that are inserting the data into that field. Likewise, as I said, if it's for reading, you need to be careful that if you change something about that field, you need to make sure that that logic that is reading that field is still valid. So moving on, we also have page layouts. This is pretty self-explanatory. Obviously, this means that the fields are being used in this page layout. Uh, there are also custom fields, right? So in this case, this is actually a formula field. And what I'm showing you here is that this formula uses the account, the customer priority field. Then the next thing we have is the workflow field updates and workflow rules. And something that is really nice about HappySoup is that actually this is not something that you would see uh, in Salesforce. And what I mean by that is that actually in Salesforce, if you go to the um, to the setup menu, maybe I should have started with this, but if you go here to the field uh, customer priority, you can also do a similar type of impact analysis here on the where is this used. However, this doesn't give you any information, as I said, on how the classes are using the field. And as you can see, it actually doesn't show you a workflow rules or field updates, which is a huge gap because again, Workflow field updates can insert data into that field. And if you just come here and think, okay, there are no workflows, then you change that field and suddenly a lot of stuff is going to break. So the way Happy Soup is able to do this is because we have custom code that manually inspects uh, the workflow, uh, workflow rule and workflow field update metadata to see if that field is used. And then the same applies to uh, flows. 
for flows, because flows are versioned, we also include uh, pills so that you know which flows are active. Because one challenge here is that you see, I think the same is here, you see the same flow um, multiple times. So if you see the same flow twice, you actually don't know why am I seeing the same flow twice. And that's because behind the scenes flows have different versions. So what I'm trying to show you here is that this is the version that is active and this one is a draft. And why does this matter? Well, because if there's a flow that is used in the field, obviously you care about the one that is active because the other ones that are older versions they're just not active. So whatever they're doing to that field doesn't really matter that much. What matters is the one that is currently active and without these fields, then you, you wouldn't know. The other thing that is nice as well is that if you go back to the setup menu, uh, all these flows are actually not flows as in you know the, the flow feature. Some of them are actually process builders, but behind the scenes, the metadata is called the same. So you wouldn't know immediately which is which. Um, so happy soup does show you the type here. So if the type is process builder, then you know obviously that is a process builder. Uh, if it's an auto launch flow or anything that mentions the word flow, it's an actual flow. So that is uh, for impact analysis on custom fields. Now I did mention earlier that a very important use case is about reports, right? If you have a report that is used in the field and you change that field, suddenly those filters or those groupings on the report could break. Now, unfortunately, the API that allows Happy Soup to work is actually in beta. So I'm just gonna go over a different topic very quickly just to show that Happy Soup relies on the metadata component dependency um, object on the tooling API, and it's actually in beta. So in the previous release, you could actually query reports and report types um, and just on, on the newer release, they've added a new limitation where reports are no longer included in the metadata component dependency, and they're only included in bulk um, API queries, which HappySoup doesn't support yet. So unfortunately, a feature just disappeared, um, like literally one day out of nowhere. Um, so before, you were able to see reports that are using that field. And I was able to show you exactly how those reports were used in that field, which again is very, very important, especially when it comes to filters. Um, so in this example here, we could see that the report was using that field for both grouping and also as a filter condition. And again, if you have a filter and you change something on that field, that filter could stop working and you would never know. Again, unfortunately, Salesforce removed that. Uh, so that feature is temporarily unavailable and it, it will come back in Happy Soup 2.0 once I implement the book API um, metadata component dependency. So I'm gonna move on here. Right, so the other scenario that I said earlier is if you're a new consultant, right? And you want to understand at a high level, how do we use the account object here? What do we do with accounts? So you can come here and select standard object. And again, we're gonna load the standard objects from your org. And then you can say, okay, account. And I want to see again, where is the account object used? And a warning here is that this is not a complete view. So I'm not claiming that this is all the places where the account um, object is used, but it is a good, um, good base. Again, this is a trial org, so I have very, few metadata, uh, but as you can see here, we can see that all these Apex classes and this Apex trigger use the account object. In a real org, you would see other stuff like workflows, validation rules, uh, et cetera. And that just gives you like a high, high level overview that, okay, I know that we use the account objects in, sorry, the account object in Visual Force pages. We seem to do a lot of automation uh, through Apex. I see a couple of workflows. Or again, you may not see a lot. And if you don't see a lot, then you need to ask, how come this core object is actually not used? And that just gives you a little bit more insight into you know, the organization uh, that you just joined. Now, another scenario that is really nice is sometimes, and this happens a lot in, in the companies that I've worked for, is you get users uh, logging cases, telling you that they're receiving some email from Salesforce that they don't want. 
and you do a little bit of research and you find the email template that they are receiving. Let's say it's this one, but you actually don't know where the email template is coming from. It could be anything, right? It could actually be Apex because you, you can send emails through Apex and you can use email templates in Apex. It could be a workflow uh, email alert. Or what if it's Apex, but the email template is returned dynamically? Like what if it's not the actual name that you would see in Apex? What if it's actually the template ID? Or what if it's the template you know, developer name? Or you know, there's all these different things, uh, different ways that you could use an email template. And just by looking at the template here in the setup menu, there's just no way to know uh, where that's being used. So let's go to Happy Soup again. And I'm going to go here to email template. And this is where, where we start seeing why Happy Soup is a lot more powerful than the standard where is this use that Salesforce provides because Salesforce only provides that for fields and not for any other objects. Now they do provide that capability with the metadata component dependency, but that's just really hard to use. And, and that's why Happy Soup actually uh, does a lot of the work behind the scenes. So I'm gonna search for that template here just to see where it is used. Okay, so we got three results here. So we got uh, a workflow alert. So we have two workflow alerts. So again, you could just click on that and say, okay, so that is the workflow alert. Yeah, I see the, I see the workflow rule. This priority makes, sorry, this uh, criteria makes sense. Let me then go to that email alert and remove that user. Could be as simple as that. Now, I also said that it is possible for an Apex class to use the email template uh, object and query the template dynamically in a way that you would never know by looking at the code that that template is going to be used. So if I open up this class here, this is just obviously a, a very basic example, but you could have this query where you say select ID from email template, and then later on you do some logic with those templates, and then the template that is selected is actually this one. And you just would never know. You would have to look at the entire code, look at the template and see if the criteria or whatever the code is doing actually matches this. So Happy Soup recognizes that. And what I'm telling you here is that there is an Apex class that uses the email template uh, in a SQL query. I'm not telling you that that class uses that email template, but I'm telling you that it might. So you should go to that class you should look at the query, you should look at the code and make a decision if maybe that is the class that is using your um, email template. And then another thing that can happen is that what if in Apex, I'm using, instead of querying the email template like this, what if I actually have the email template ID stored in a custom label, right? Because that's also possible. You could have the custom template, sorry, the email template ID or the API name or the label in a custom label. And then in Apex, when you send the email, you just use that custom label value to define which email template to send. And there's many benefits of that, right? You could then change the custom label directly in production. You don't need to change the code, but then it just makes it virtually impossible to realize that there's a dependency between that class and that email template. So, Again, Happy Soup recognizes that. So we actually search for custom labels matching all three. So what I'm showing you here is that there's a, there's a custom label where the value is the API name of the email template. As you can see here, the unique name, the template that the custom label is using that. There's also a custom label that uses the template ID as the value. And again, there's another custom label that uses the template label as the value. So I think this covers a lot of use cases where again, you just wouldn't, you, you just would never know. And then with Happy Soup, then you very quickly know that, okay, I have a few workflow alerts, a few classes that use the, the email template uh, in queries. And potentially you would find that the value is in a custom label. And again, uh, without this capability, it would be almost, it would be really, really hard to find that the email template is indirectly being used uh, through a custom label. Now, this is not part of the metadata component dependency. This is actually custom code that HappySoup has, um, you know, 
to allow for this scenario. So I'm just gonna head over to the chat um, just very quickly. So yeah, so when I'll be able to run uh, the analysis on reports, um, that's honestly going to take a little, uh, some time just because the book API is very different and it requires a few architectural changes in Happy Soup. Um, so that's gonna be a, probably a few months. Then the other question there is, is there a limit on the numbers that you can query at the time? Sort of, so there are two limits. When you, when you get the results here of where the field is or the template or whatever is being used, by default, the API is going to return only 2000 results. That is the first limit. And as you can see here is recognized, sorry, it's documented um, on the metadata component dependency. However, that only applies to the objects returned by the metadata component dependency. The reason I say that is because all these three here are actually pure custom code of happy soup. This is not a metadata component dependency, this is my code. So if you were to get 2000 and then all of these, you will get 2000 plus. That limitation wouldn't exist uh, for happy soup. The other limit is that obviously right now we're doing one item at a time, right? And so if you have 15 custom fields that you want to do impact analysis on, then you actually have to go one by one. And so that is uh, something that I wanted to discuss later, but I'll say it now, that's coming as well on Happy Soup 2.0, which is the ability to uh, to do bulk impact analysis. So I don't have a demo of that because again, that's, that's very complicated, but what I'm thinking now is that I'm going to allow for up to maybe 25 items at the same time, and those 25 items could be of different types. So you could do five custom fields, 10 email templates, and a few Apex classes, and you know, get me the entire thing that depends on on, on this uh, metadata um, items. That would use the book API um, metadata component dependency capability. So a lot of things actually are starting now to depend on that. So I think Salesforce is actually pushing some of the functionality over to the book API, like again, the limitation on how many records and the limitation on reports. So this just means that now more than ever is more it is very critical that I implement um, that feature. I think that's pretty much it for dependent or for impact analysis. There are other things you can do, right? You can also see where a custom button is used. Uh, you can see um, where a standard field is used. Actually, that that is a good um, so, something that I missed here. So let me demo that. So for standard fields, we only support a few. Um, so as you can see, there's only 23. And obviously there are more than 23 standard fields in, in any given org. The standard fields that we support are, to be honest, a bit arbitrary. I just selected the, cost, the standard fields that I know are used the most. So for example, if we search here by opportunity, we'll see that these are the ones that are available. And this is just based on my experience that these are you know, what I know people would actually use uh, in the opportunity object. By all means, it's not, an, it, it's not the complete view. As you can see for accounts, there's only a few, and I'm sure there's other fields in the account, like maybe the account type that I missed to include. Uh, on Happy Soup 2.0, I plan to make this a little more dynamic where you actually get the real um, set of custom or standard fields that are available in that org. So what's actually important here is that, so we're looking at the opportunity stage, right? The metadata component dependency has no support whatsoever for standard field at all. Uh, and then I presume that the same is true uh, if you go here. Um, so if you go to the stage here, yeah, there is no way in Salesforce to see where a standard field is used. And when they came out with this API, one of the major complaints is that it's great, but what about standard fields? So that limitation is still there, but Again, Happy Soup has a ton of custom code. A lot of work has been put into this so that you can actually do impact analysis on standard fields. And as you can see, the list is pretty, it's pretty good, right? It's not just like two things that you can see. You can actually see you know, the, the, the stage field being used in Apex classes, workflow rules, workflow field updates, validation rules. And I'll give you an example here is that when you have validation rules, the field can be used in two different ways. It can be used on the error condition, right, which is here, 
But then you also have the error location, which is where the field, so where the error is displayed. And this is actually a field that you have to select. So I have another, um, I have both examples here just to show you that uh, the custom code that I've written accounts for both scenarios, where you can have a validation rule using the field as the actual criteria, or maybe it just uses the field as the location. Um, we can also show you um, Visual Force Pages, Apex Triggers, and Visual Force Email Templates. I should probably make the clarification here that this only includes Visual Force Email Templates. So again, it's not a complete list, but what Salesforce gives you is pretty much nothing. So I think that you know this is actually a pretty good start. Okay, so yeah, so standard fields. Uh, I, I've asked the same question to Salesforce: why you know why don't they don't support it? And they just said that behind the scenes, the architecture is totally different. Um, I, I have no idea, to be honest, why, why that is. But uh, I don't think that that's coming anytime soon. Uh, I have seen the question asked multiple times on the chat group for the API, and it's always been not a priority. And I know that they're actually having uh, scalability issues, and that is why they move reports away from the API, and they moved it over to the bulk APIs, because this API is not scaling well. Uh, so I think that supporting standard fields is probably very long, um, very far in, in the roadmap. Okay, so I think that's, that's pretty good for impact analysis. Just keep in mind that you can use this in many other types, including like field sets and custom labels and other things. Uh, a thing that I forgot to mention here is that you can actually download this metadata here as a package XML. And this will make more sense in the next uh, section, but you can also take these results and copy them as a CSV format or Excel, and then you can do whatever you want. Maybe you can share them with a colleague or something so that you can do impact analysis together without both of you having to be used in Happy Soup at the same time. All right, okay, so this base layout optimization, I'll show it later because I need to explain the deployment boundary first. So deployment boundary is actually a very new concept, so I'll do my best to explain it. Uh, let me see, where is my, right, okay. So I have this class here called um, Happy Soup Extension. And as you can see, this Apex class has a lot of dependencies. It uses a Happy Soup test data. It has a bunch of custom objects, some fields in those objects. Here it has another controller that is completely separate from this class. So there's a lot of stuff there, right? Now, imagine that, uh, let's say, Eric, you ask me, hey, Pablo, can you give me that class? Like. Can, can you just send me that class so that I can do some work uh, as well? well? That would only be possible, obviously, if you have the same org, right? Or maybe you have a sandbox with, that has the same um, metadata. But what if you had a scratch org? Or what if you have a trailhead org? And for some reason, we wanted to collaborate on this class together. Well, it's impossible. I cannot just copy paste. Well, I certainly can, but I could co copy this class and I can send you the, the, the text but you will never be able to just paste it in a developer console and save it because obviously everything that this class depends on just doesn't exist in your org. You don't have this happy soup test data. You don't have this custom object Jira ticket. You don't have these custom fields. You need, you will need everything that this class depends on before you can actually create this um, Apex class in your org. And that's what a deployment boundary is. So a deployment boundary, at a high level is everything that a piece of metadata needs to exist. So there's actually an article on Salesforce Ben that explains in detail uh, what deployment boundaries are. And I'll explain now, but I, I, I suggest that you look this up because it has a little more detail. But the example that I give here is if you think again of another example is of a workflow email alert. What does a workflow email alert need to exist? Well. It needs some fields, right? So let's say the custom, let's say the workflow email alert depends on some custom field because it uses that custom field somewhere. And well, that custom field also needs something else. It needs the fields that it uses to, to drive the logic of the formula. But the workflow uh, email alert also depends on an email template. And that template depends on some custom field. And those custom fields and the email alert itself depend on an object existing in the org. What I'm trying to show you here is that if I delete this field from the org, this workflow rule cannot, this workflow email alert cannot exist. So this field needs to exist before this workflow email alert can be present in the org. 
And the same is about this. If I delete this field here, well, the workflow email alert can certainly exist, but the functionality is now incomplete because through the email template, this field is actually used. So why is this important? So there, there are a few reasons. The first one, and this is where the name Happy Soup uh, comes from, is that when we think about the metadata in, in our org, unless you have unlocked packages and all that, which most people don't have, but in a normal org, you think about your metadata as really a Happy Soup, a bunch of metadata just everywhere, a bunch of email alerts here, a bunch of classes here, loads of fields here, and the only division or structure is the object, right? You have fields for this object, you have fields for this other object, but everything else is just thrown in there together. You as a, as a consultant or as an admin, you know that some of those metadata items are actually connected and they are actually connected to allow for a functional feature or a business process to exist. But you can't see that in Salesforce. However, you can see the deployment boundary, right? Again, if we're talking about a workflow email alert and you start to recognize the parts that are needed for this email alert, suddenly your org is not a bunch of metadata flying everywhere. Your org becomes actually a group of deployment boundaries. Where again, you have some metadata here, some metadata there, but if you can draw the line between one metadata's deployment boundary and the other, suddenly it doesn't look that messy. Now you know, hey, hold on, this workflow rule and all these things work together to create a functional you know, business process or, or a unit of work. And this landing web component here also uses these custom fields and maybe a custom label, and that represents one unit of work. So what I'm trying to show here is that if you can see your org as a group of deployment boundaries, you realize that there is some structure in your org even if you wouldn't normally see it because Salesforce doesn't allow you to, to put this structure into place. And so those, that's kind of what the deployment boundary is. And I'm just gonna see the chat, to see if there are any questions. Um, right, um, not, not really any questions, but um, so then there are two use cases here, right? This that I just described, now you understand your org a little more. Now you realize that it's not just a bunch of metadata here and there, it, there is some structure. Now, if we go back to the use case that I said earlier, what if someone like you know Eric has a scratch org that is 100% empty? There's nothing on that org, not a single thing, but he wants to collaborate on this Apex class with me. Well, as I said, you, can't. you have to have the metadata that this class depends on. And if this class depends on a field, you also need the object that that field belongs to. And if this class belong, depends on another class, you need also what this class depends on. You need everything. You need the entire thing all the way down before you can actually create this class in an empty org. And that empty org could be like a scratch org or you know, a trailhead org. Let me, let me go ahead and, and show you that. So if we go here and go to Apex classes, That takes a while. Then we search here for Happy Soup um, extension. And now we're going to use what it depends on or deployment boundary. All right. So what we see here is that at a high level, initially, the class Happy Soup extension depends on three things it depends on Apex classes, custom objects, and custom fields. So let's see what Apex classes it depends on. Okay, so it depends on three Apex classes, the Happy Soup API mocks, the extension controller, and that Happy Soup test data. But as I said, these classes also have their own dependencies. So this class, the API mocks, actually depends on another class called Happy Soup um, Metadata API, which in turn depends on yet another class called SRM Metadata API. And you can actually keep drilling down here until you get to the last metadata uh, item in the tree. So if I go back here and I expand them all, what this is right here is everything that needs to exist before this Apex class can exist in any other org. So then this allows for scratch org development, which, you know, when scratch orgs came up, it was like, oh, this big thing, but 
it's empty. So realistically, no one can start just working on an empty org um, unless it's a brand new project. But if you have a deployment boundary, then you can say, hey, you know what? We need to iterate on this Apex class. And let's just do it on a scratch org for whatever reason. Then you can just create a scratch org. You create a deployment boundary. You download the package XML uh, here, which will have um, everything there already in the, let me see if I can format this. There, it will have everything already in the package XML format. Then you can use this to do a retrieve from the source org and then do a deployment on that um, scratch org. And then what happens is that scratch org is going to have everything that that class depends on plus the plus the apex class itself so suddenly that scratch org is almost like the original org for the purposes of development on this class and if you think about it that org doesn't know or the class the code doesn't know <laughs> that it's not in the same org because it, it has everything that it needs uh, to exist so this was the original intention when I created Happy Soup. And it's just a fun fact that the impact analysis capability actually came out much later on when somebody told me, hey, can you do the same but the other way around? And I said, yeah, actually I can. And it was very quick, but I spent months uh, developing the, the logic for this, uh, which is it, it's very, very complicated. And of course, it, it uses the metadata component dependency API, but there's no way that you would just get this sort of um, functionality out of the box um, with the API. And if I go back to my slides, right, there was something here about page layout optimization. You might think, what, what's that about? Well, now that you understand what a deployment boundary is, which is everything that a metadata type or item needs to exist, if we think, what is the deployment boundary of a page layout? What does a page layout need to exist? Well, a page layout to exist, well, it needs the custom fields on it, standard fields. Maybe there's a few custom buttons on the page layout, and maybe there's a few visual force pages on the page layout. So almost by happy coincidence, the deployment boundary of a page layout gives you a data dictionary of all the fields on that page layout. So if I go here and I search for the account layout, that's gonna give me everything that the layout depends on. And again, those are the fields and maybe you know the custom buttons. And it even gives me the fields that other fields depend on, like in this case, this formula. So if I then export this to, to a CSV file, uh, let me see if I can actually I'm just going to pause for a second, just very quickly, because I need to open up a Google sheet here and I don't have it. I'm just gonna show you what the sort of data dictionary would look like. Right, okay, we're back. Let me share my screen again. Right, so if I go here and then I say, okay, copy to Excel, I can go back to, I can go here to Excel and I can just do copy paste and that's it, right? And again, if you think about it, well, this is like a very short, not super detailed, but it is kind of like a data dictionary, right? Where now you know, these are the fields that are used in the page layout. And because you have them in Excel, then you can share them with a colleague. Maybe you're doing some business analysis to find out if there are some redundant fields or maybe there are just too many fields in the page layout. And this just gives you that information just very quickly. And again, it's almost like a coincidence because it's, it's like a byproduct of the deployment boundary concept. And a nice feature here is that I showed you on the UI here that the customer priority field, even though it is used directly on the page layout, is also used indirectly on the page layout because the page layout uses this formula and this formula depends on this field to exist. So we go back to that concept. If I delete this field, this formula cannot exist. The formula can only exist as it is because of the presence of this field. So you could say that the page layout depends on this field, but indirectly. And when you copy the results to Excel, 
uh, I actually make that distinction here. So what I'm saying here is that these fields are used by the account layout via or via itself. They're being used directly. However, the customer priority is used by the layout, but via another field. So it's an indirect relationship. So even if you stay away from or if you get out of happy, so but if you put the results in an Excel sheet, then you still have that level of detail. So I think that's uh, all I have for for uh, deployment boundaries. So I want to just take a pause and see if there are any questions. Uh, if not, then I'm going to show the, the newer version of Happy Soup and talk a little bit about the roadmap. I had one question, and it just generally had some comments. I mean, I wanted to say, well done. That was a really excellent, very thorough demonstration of a topic that I think for a lot of people seeing for the first time can be a little bit complicated to understand or, or at least imagine. So really well done there. Um, I, I think it's such an important topic and a gap in, in kind of the Salesforce tooling. And uh, the reality is that providing a metadata API doesn't really make it available to the majority of people who need it, which is business analysts, administrators. Um, and so Happy Soup bridges that gap in a really beautiful way. It's all about value adding work and putting efficiencies in place wherever we can. Uh, one of the things that occurred to me is optimizing test scripts, which is something we haven't really mentioned yet. But the reality is that you don't have to test an entire application's functionality if you know that you're adding something that only affects some very small subset of that application. And this tool that you've just shown us really helps us figure that out. Um, so in terms of optimizing test scripts and regression packs, I think deployment boundaries are really special. Um, now, I didn't know if I heard you correctly in terms of positioning deployment boundaries as an alternative to the kind of collaboration you'd expect from repositories. My own experience, I think that in development, if you want to make sure that somebody's you know, effectively collaborating with you, they would deploy the same feature that you're working on and, and go that approach. However, um, you know, if you have a remote repository with a whole bunch of stuff in it, the happy soup term I'll use, um, and you want to start breaking that up specific to applications, something Salesforce has been telling us to do for a few years. And, and, and the question comes up, well, where the heck do you get started? Well, you've just shown us where to get started, a tool like this. This is this is really incredible, and I can't wait to put it to better use. Now, my question, I did say there was a question. My question is, with regards to dependencies and impact analysis, profiles and permission sets are definitely a piece of that, right? Access. So if I'm going to rip out a field, who is that going to affect? Mm -hmm. Not just what, what processes and components, but who? And so I wondered what thoughts you had on that, Pablo, and, and everyone else on the call, what thoughts you have about that? Yeah, no, uh, just to answer first, yeah, you're 100% right. And I did think about that um, in the past. I'm just making a note here because, yeah, that is that is part of the impact. Um, right? Who's actually seeing this field or who can maybe just read it? But that is definitely part of, of, of the impact um, sort of boundary. So that, that gap is missing. So I, I do plan to eventually um, allow for that. The challenge with a lot of these things is that none of this is supported by the metadata component dependency, right? So it, it requires a lot of um, manual testing on my end to see, okay, maybe can I use a tooling API? If it's not, can I use the metadata API? And, and obviously that's the fun part, uh, but it, it, it takes a little while uh, to get those things right. But I, I do plan to include that in, in the future. Thanks very much for that. Yeah, that's all my questions. All right, so I'm just seeing here that there was a question about whether it's free. So yeah, let me go then to that repository. So it is free. Um, so it's it's here in, um, it's called SFDC Happy Soup in GitHub. So the entire code is here. There's actually a lot of information here about how to use it. Uh, there's some information about deployment boundaries. Uh, if you're interested in the technical details, there's also a lot of information about how Happy Soup enhances the metadata component dependency. Um, because there's a lot of things that we do behind the scenes to make sure that the data looks correct. Um, some people have concerns about security, and this is actually a good time to talk about that. This is hosted on my own Heroku account, and some people rightly ask the question that, you know, what about our data? Like, how do we know that you're not you know, using our, our API access to download all the opportunities and put them in the black market? That is a it is 100% valid concern. So the first thing is obviously I am deeply involved in the Salesforce ecosystem and I've been doing this for 10 years. So I, you know, obviously I have no intention of ever doing anything like that. Um, 
but there's also a lot of security that I've uh, put around the app and it's, it's all documented here. So there's some security on the server side. Uh, we use SSL so the data is not uh, seen in transit. And the only data that is stored is temporarily is just, for example, if you go here, if I go back to custom fields, you would have noticed that the first time I did this, it took a little longer. Now it takes like two seconds and that's because that's cached. The moment you log out, that information is gone. Other than that, Happy Soup doesn't query any actual objects uh, in the org. And of course, I understand that is not enough for many organizations. So I have always, since day one, given the option to deploy this to your own Heroku account because this is a Heroku app in the end. Um, so there are instructions here on how to do it. And there is also a way to deploy it with Docker, which is a lot more faster. And there's also a, a tutorial on YouTube on how to do it. The problem with this approach, obviously, is that it falls out of sync very, very quickly, especially because this tool is new. So I'm still doing things almost every day. And so if you installed it in your own Heroku account six months ago, you don't have any of the bug fixes or new features that I've introduced. So I mean, really, all I can say is, you know, use it in a sandbox. I always recommend to use it in a sandbox. Happy Soup doesn't need access to your data anyway. So there's no reason to use it in production unless you really have to for some reason. Uh, worst case, you can download it um, or not worst case. The other option is, again, uh, download it and use it with Docker. But you would somehow need to be aware of the changes that I'm making so that you always have the latest uh, image from, from Docker. So one way you can do that is if you're in GitHub, you can actually watch the repository and you can subscribe to all activity. So then you would be notified every time I make like an update and then if you want, then you can download the latest Docker file and use it locally. The other thing is that the API that I created for this, right? So th there's a huge wrapper around the metadata component dependency that does a lot of other stuff, including the standard field support and all that. That is actually another uh, package. It's actually a JavaScript library that I own as well called SFDC Soup. And this is actually what Happy Soup uses behind the scenes to do everything that I've shown you. So it is a JavaScript API and you can get the information in Excel or CSV format, JSON tree, package XML, and you can also get some like stats objects. So for example, you could see where a custom field is used and then you will get information like this. This is the package XML of all the metadata items that are used in that field. This is the dependency tree, which is exactly what Happy Soup is showing you in the UI and everything is there. So what I'm trying to tell to say to you here is that if none of the options uh, work for you of you know maybe using Happy Soup locally or having a Heroku app that gets out of sync, you could always create your own app. And I know that sounds a little crazy, but actually some people have done that. And I know Accenture in Australia has a project called um, Salesforce Power Scripts, which is like a deployment pipeline. And they are actually using the core uh, JavaScript package for impact analysis. So it's not unheard of, and it is always an option. If you don't want to use Happy Soup, but you like the API, you can just use the API directly. So I'm just gonna go here and see if there's any more questions. Uh, no, okay, so I'm just gonna show then the new version. So the new version has a few, what's this one here? So this, this is the login page. There's a few differences. Most of them are cosmetic, and this has nothing to do with, I mean, probably most of you are, are not interested in what I'm going to say now, but all this development that is done here was actually, it is is all manual. Like I did not use any JavaScript framework. There's no CSS framework. It's all pure DOM manipulation, pure CSS, which is crazy. And the only reason I did it was because I really wanted to learn uh, how to manipulate the DOM and I wanted to really understand CSS because I had used it in the past, but I had never done like a proper, you know, full stack app with those technologies. So it was great for learning, but uh, it just cannot scale. It is literally to the point where there is so much code, so much, so much DOM manipulation, so much CSS that I just cannot add any feature to it because it's just way too much code. So the the first intention with um, Happy Soap 2.0 was to use a proper JavaScript framework and a proper CSS framework so that I can actually build it a lot faster and that I can create features 
a lot faster because I do have a whole roadmap um, that I want to, to implement. And so the second part is, again, the new version with a new framework is going to allow for that roadmap to be possible. So that would be like book impact analysis and other things that I'll demo in a moment. So the technology of choice is Vue, which is a JavaScript framework, and the CSS is called Bulma, um, which is actually very nice. So this is not live. This is only on my local computer right now, but it's pretty much the same, right? So you go to Happy Soup, you choose um, how to log in. So I'm gonna use my production, not my real production, obviously, but my trailhead here. And as you can see, it looks totally different, right? Like, like all of a sudden, it looks like a whole different um, application. So the first thing is, I've separated impact analysis from deployment boundaries because first it was actually just a drop down here. And so it's not immediately clear why some options have both and some of them just have one. So let me give you an example. If you go here to validation rules, you'll see that validation rule automatically doesn't have where is this used. Why is that? Well, it's because you can't use a validation rule anywhere. A validation rule just exists. It's not something that you can reference somewhere. But so this means that this dropdown dynamically has one or two options depending on the metadata type you select. And I realize it's not obvious why. So the first thing is that I've separated impact analysis here. It has some metadata types. Deployment boundaries here has a different set of metadata types. And also the page layout dictionary is its own page uh, where you can only select page layouts. And then you can see the, the sort of dictionary data right there on the screen without you having to download the, um, the results to, to Excel. So I'm just gonna show that very quickly. Again, these all in development, so something might break or, you know, it's, it's not yet perfect. Let's see, then, then you can see the, the dictionary right there. You can see more entries here if you need to, and you can still download, you know, as a package XML or, or Excel or CSV. So it's all a lot more, you know, separated or organized so it's easier to understand what you're doing when it comes to impact analysis i'm very excited with some of the features for um one of the features for custom fields is that now we can see how much a field is actually used in the data because that's also a gap right just like you said earlier that profits and permission sets is part of the impact analysis also how much the field is actually used by the data not the metadata is hugely important because if a field is used by a ton of metadata but it's actually not used anywhere in in the record something's off right maybe we plan for this field to be super important and in the end nobody used it and that gives you a level of insight that you otherwise wouldn't know so if i go here and select the same field um customer priority now one of the toppings here is field population by record type and you see also that the way that the results are displayed is totally different. So I'm gonna show that as well. All right, okay. So as you can see, we have now uh, four different views. So the first one is the tree view. And I've added a lot more detail here. So for example, when it comes to read or write, you know, if an Apex class is using that field, now I actually explain what that means, right? Because I realized before just saying write wasn't really self-explanatory. So now you can just put your mouse over it and it'll tell you what that means. Uh, also for workflow rules, which wasn't on the previous version, I've also added if the workflow rule is active or you know deactivated. And I've also added the type of workflow rule because none of the workflow rules are the same. Some only trigger on creation, some create, some trigger on create an update. And then the same thing for flows, but this was already on, on the previous version. So essentially I've extended this um, data set to also be available for workflow rules. The other thing is you can see everything in a table view. So you don't need and you don't need to export the data to Excel. You can still do it, but if you want to just see it in this way, you can still do it. Uh, again, there's a few filters here. If you just want to see Apex classes, you can just type in class and then in two seconds, you just see the classes that are used in the field. Then the chart view is here, which is the same one that you saw earlier. And the brand new one, which I'm very happy about is the field utilization. So essentially what this is saying is that in my org, there are 39 account records. 
and 34 of those account records have a value on this field, which means that 87% of the fields, sorry, of, of the accounts in the org have a value in that field, which is pretty good, right? If it was like 2% or 5%, then there's something off with that field. And then I give it the breakdown by record type, which is very important as well, because just knowing that 87% of the records use the field is not enough, because if you have 10 record types, you would also want to know, well, is it maybe that for this record type, this field doesn't make sense? Or maybe for this record type, there's already a duplicate field that people are using. So again, my whole goal here with Happy Soup is always one step further on, on that level of insight that you otherwise wouldn't know. So potentially in the future, there will be another tab here for profiles and permission sets, right? Where you would be able to see um, what profiles and permission sets are using that field. In terms of roadmap, um, the deployment boundary is the same, so I'm not gonna demo that. But in terms of roadmap, there are a few things that I want to do. The first one was this, which is pretty much ready, the field utilization by record type. The second one is bulk impact analysis, which as I said, is going to support up to 25 metadata uh, items at the same time. So you'll be able to select 10 fields, 10 classes, and five you know, uh, custom labels, and get an email maybe 10 minutes later with the entire, um, I guess, impact boundary, right? What what would be impacted if you make changes to all these metadata types? Um, another feature that I've never actually discussed uh, in public uh, is something that I, I'm going to call Apex Bio. And an Apex Bio is essentially a way to understand your Apex classes a lot better. Because I realized that with the metadata component dependency, right, when I look at the deployment boundary of an Apex class and I see what that class uses, I can actually use that to tell you a lot more about that class. I can, I could eventually tell you with more analysis if the class, how many SQL queries are in the class, how many DMLs are in the class, what are those DMLs? Is it on the opportunity object? Is it on the account object? Uh, and essentially, it would create sort of like a biography of the class, if you will. Something that you can share with a colleague that is going to work on, on a class that they've never worked on. You can just come to Happy Soup and get the Apex bio. And that bio would immediately tell you, okay, this class depends on this number of metadata types. It depends on this many objects. It has this number of inserts. It uses this number of um, circle queries. And it has this other stuff. And suddenly that person, in five minutes has a high level overview of that class, like the biography of that class. And that would equip them with a lot more knowledge to start working on that class. And that would be obviously powered um, by the metadata component dependency. So uh, I think that's it. There's gonna be a few more things here. Like there's gonna be a settings page where you can see, um, or you can change a few settings in Happy Soup. You can also go to the org directly from Happy Soup. Um, Another thing is, I don't, didn't mention this, but all these are clickable. So you can click on all this and, and go to the, to the org. And um, yeah, that's it. I'm pretty much done. Maybe understatement of the day. <laughs> that, was, that was fantastic. I mean, uh, gosh, I, I, I can only speak for myself, I guess, but I, I'm gonna be putting this to good use immediately. Um, and I really look forward to Happy Soup 2.0, little demo looks incredible. Uh, it, it, you know, some of those small modernizations, what a big impact they make. Um, for those of you who have stuck around, I really appreciate you being here. Do you have any other questions or comments? Because please, while you have Pablo, now's the time. Just want to say thank you, Pablo. Just an amazing, amazing tool and amazing contribution. Very yeah. eye opening, very eye opening. Cool. Well, thank you very much. Actually, that, that, um, there's another thing I could say is that uh, I also plan with Happy Soup 2.0 to release a proper set of tutorials on how to contribute to Happy Soup. Because a lot of the times people come up with open source apps and they say, oh, you can contribute. And you, you just can't go to an open source project and start contributing because there's a huge amount of domain knowledge that is required to touch a single line of code. And that always has sort of piss me off a little bit when I see an open source project that I, I how can I collaborate on this where I just don't know anything about the architecture 
And with the previous version of Happy, so there was no architecture because it was just a bunch of code. Now there's a lot more structure. Uh, like I said, there's Vue on the front end, there's Node.js on the back end, there's Booma for the CSS. So when I release that, I plan to release a proper set of tutorials on how to build Happy Soup locally. If you want to change things, how, how it should be done, because I, I really would want people to feel empowered to, to contribute. We actually, I actually have been partnering with um, uh, someone in Portugal who worked with me for the past three months to develop a bit more capability for uh, standard fields uh, analysis. So it was very good working with him and I would want to work with other people, but I recognize that I need to, I need to do a better job at, at explaining how to do that before people can feel safe, you know, to, to do that. So that's, that's coming as well. Lastly, add that I think you explained everything very well and Beyond using dependency API and the where is this used directly in the org, the granular aggregations that your tool provides is so much more insightful. I just, again, I can't wait to start using it, you know, every day because I certainly have the opportunity. So thank you again. Yeah, you're very welcome and thanks for your nice work. Well, with that, then we might uh, get around to the close of the call and uh, let everybody go off back to work. Nice evening or what, whatever you're up to. Pablo, maybe you can get officially get out of the sun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Farther away from your windows there. Thanks again uh, for your visit. I hope we'll be able to get together in person soon. But uh, yeah, really fantastic uh, demonstration. So thank you so much for that. All right. Cheers. Thank you, everyone.